I could observe it here on the mod monitor as well. That receiver connected one. And okay on the uh, transmitter design and the 833s. Yeah, the 833, it's a great tube. This time we're going to look at the command receiver. This is probably the most famous of, uh, of all of the ARC-5 equipment. And uh, it represents a, uh, a beginner's receiver for many of us. This was the first receiver that we ever played with when we were kids. A lot of times uh, ham radio operators would drop these off to the prospective novice and he would play with this receiver and this is what would get the kid hooked and start to uh, get interested in shortwave listening and ham radio. Now the, uh, the receiver itself is part of the systems that were on board the B-17 and B-24 bombers of World War II and many other aircraft. I'm not going to get into that history. What I'm going to focus on is how this receiver came to be found in so many ham shacks and really how you can put one on the air today. Now these receivers are upwards of 75 years old now and a lot of the components are starting to fail inside so there's going to be a little bit of repair work needed to put an ARC-5 receiver or a command set receiver back on the air. This particular receiver was one that uh, a guy dug out of his garage and uh, gave to me just for this uh, for this video and I've got lots of pictures of it as found. As you can see it uses metal tubes. This particular unit, the 454, tunes from 3 megahertz to 6 megahertz. Uh, there's also ARC-5 variants of this that tune the same range. And uh, there's a, a 6 to 9 megahertz uh, receiver that's uh, also very popular. Um, this particular receiver is usable for ham radio and for shortwave listening. And the uh, 7 to 9.1 megahertz versions are uh, make some pretty nice shortwave receivers. Packed all aluminum construction with metal type tubes. It uh, uses a, uh, a tuning mechanism that was originally on something that looked like a speedometer cable that went into this uh, into this port. I've got a local knob that I've put on the front, but this would have been tuned remotely. Now hams, when they got their hands on these things, wanted to do all the tuning right from the front of the receiver. So the first thing you had to do was figure out how to uh, control the volume or the gain of the set, how to plug in a pair of headphones, for instance like these HS33 headphones, and how to turn the BFO on and off or the CW oscillator on and off. So this area in the front where a plug-in went originally on the receiver usually was where they mounted these components. A, a potentiometer, usually between uh, 20 and 75K, 50K was a popular value for the gain control. A phone jack, it could be a regular two circuit uh, phone jack, and a switch to turn the BFO on and off. Now those three components could be put on a small plate that would mount on the front of the receiver, and that would give you the, the local the local controls. This little control over here is the trimmer, the antenna trimmer, and the antenna connects into this jack here. So all we have is tuning, antenna jack, the antenna trimmer, the BFO on off, where you plug in your headphones, and finally your gain control. Canada, coordinated universal time. connectors, what normally would go into the rack mount, what the receiver went into. 
but if you put your finger on this accidentally, you get a shock. So I put a small piece of tape on there. The dynamotor normally sits in this space here. And uh, a lot of times these receivers had uh, power supply kits that would go in on this rear deck. So a typical power supply would use a transformer about this size, would mount something like that. It might have a small choke, something this or smaller, uh, a capacitor, and a 5Y3 uh, <clears throat> type of rectifier. And this would all fit in this back section. And then there'd be an AC cord and an on-off switch back here, and you could turn it on and off, and the thing would have its own AC supply. A lot of hams built those. The receiver, as built, is designed to uh, drive either high impedance or 600 ohm headphones. Uh, it uh, normally is wired for the low impedance for the 600 ohm headphones. So if you want to drive a speaker with it, you have to use a matching transformer. And a lot of people took a matching transformer and they uh, put it inside a speaker enclosure. This is actually a multi output uh, transformer used for uh, speakers inside buildings and it has different taps for different power levels. All I did is put one of those inside this speaker box with a switch and now I can control the impedance and this works very well with a multitude of surplus receivers with various impedances from 8 ohms all the way up to 1000 ohms. A lot of literature exists for these receivers. Um, here's a late one uh, from November 2012, Electric Radio, uh, by David Ishmael. Basically, he's telling us how we can build a junk box power supply for the ARC-5 type receivers. It's a very good article, and uh, his idea is to use a, a conventional transformer and a, a 24 volts DC type uh, circuit for the filaments of the tubes. Uh, the interesting command sets were so high that uh, actually CQ Magazine did a whole compendium called Command Sets that has uh, about uh, 15 or 20 articles on converting the transmitters and the receivers. And the surplus radio conversion manuals uh, feature a lot of information on the command sets. There are literally hundreds of articles on this receiver. You'll find it all over the internet as well. So, uh, a fun receiver. I remember the first time I laid eyes on one, I was over at my best friend Billy's house, and uh, his Elmer, a college student at St. Lawrence University, had dropped one of these babies off. They had it hooked up to a wire and a small speaker in his room. The wire was just running out the window, and I can remember listening to uh, the uh, CHU timecode and CW and it's a flashback every time I touch one of these receivers because it brings me right back to a uh, childhood friend's room and seeing the receiver for the first time. I was probably 15 or 16 years old at the time and here I am still fooling around with these receivers today. There are endless uh, variations on the command set receivers sometimes called the ARC-5 receivers uh, the most popular models were the uh, R26, ARC-5, and the BC-454. Um, these uh, covered 3 to 6 megahertz, um, had an intermediate frequency of 1415 kilohertz, 1415 kilohertz, and uh, were six tube super heterodynes. Uh, the original tube lineup is uh, 12 SK7 and the RF amplifier a 12K8 converter tube, uh, two more 12SK7s as IF amplifiers, a 12SR7 that was a detector and also uh, served as a BFO and a reflex circuit, and finally the 12A6 audio output tube which drove the headphones. 
in the ARC-5 only, the 12SF7 replaced the 12SR7. Now some of these uh, sets have been uh, modified extensively uh, by wiring the filaments from the 20, original 24 to 28 volts DC to uh, putting them all in parallel, that is all the 12 volt tubes could be put in parallel by grounding one of the filament pins and then running the uh, filament voltage to all of the other open pins. Uh, you could run it on 12 volts DC. But most of these were converted uh, in that way so they could be run on automotive power or 6 volts DC. So what they would do is they would replace the 12 volt tubes with their 6 volt equivalents. For instance, the 12SK7 RF amplifier would be replaced by a 6SK7. Well, we should probably talk about what you're going to find when you uh, get a hold of one of these receivers at uh, Hamfest or on eBay or dig one out of the attic or someone gives you one. You have to remember that these things were a mainstay receiver for beginners, probably from the late 40s all the way through maybe the mid-60s to early 70s. So you're going to find them in every condition imaginable. They're going to be drilled into, they're going to have modifications galore. And this was encouraged, by the way, by all the articles in publication. Uh, this particular compendium by CQ of all the CQ articles on command set conversions called command sets, it's absolutely full of all kinds of modifications. The complaint was the receiver doesn't have enough output into a small speaker, I need more gain, so uh, people would change out the transformer that's in the set and replace it with a small 8 ohm kind of transformer to drive a speaker. Uh, they would add an extra stage, like an audio amplifier stage, before the power amplifier. They would change out the 12A6 tube to something like a 6V6 or a 12L6, something with more gain, maybe from an automobile radio. Uh, I've even heard of people uh, running the entire set directly off the line, putting in tubes like a 50L6, uh, 35Z5, and so on, and doing a series string and then making a voltage doubler type of circuit right off the line to run the entire set uh, AC DC style. Can you imagine a, a chassis like this and you come across ground and you've got the neutral and the hot switch this thing will give you one heck of a shock. Strange modifications under the chassis. I, I got one that had a, a 6AL5 tube, a small dual diode mounted cross with a cross member inside the chassis. The article had talked about replacing the 12 SR7 detector BFO tube with a dual triode tube like a 6SL7 or a 12SL7 and then committing one of the halves to an audio amplifier and the other half to the, to the BFO and then uh, getting your detection and your automatic gain control. This doesn't have automatic gain control, by the way. They would add automatic gain control to it with, a, with a, usually a dual diode tube like a 6AL5. That would be mounted below chassis. Half of the tube could be the detector and the AGC, and the other half would typically be a noise limiter. So I have a receiver like that in my mobile. It's an elegant conversion, I'm not going to restore that receiver. I'm going to leave it as is because the conversion artist did such a nice job on that receiver. So I just wanted to let you know you could run into almost anything with these receivers uh, as far as mods go. The other problem is how do you tune it? Uh, you've got your tuning knob here and I've got this nice tuning knob that was made out of a speedo cable that was used to tune the receiver. They cut the cable and ended up with a shaft extender that would mount on the front of the receiver just as this was a tuning, uh, a tuning cable. So out of each tuning cable they would get two adapters for two different knobs. So, of course, eventually those 
those uh, speedo cables became very rare. So now people were trying to figure out how to tune this receiver. And you see people that pounded quarter inch copper tubing onto this thing, uh, all types of plastic tubing. Some people machined things to go on there. I've seen pipe fittings put on the front. There's a lot of different ideas. So let's go through the uh, cleanup process of a receiver that you might have just picked up at a ham fest or perhaps got uh, off eBay or some from some uh, ham's attic. Um, it's going to be pretty dirty. Um, first uh, check inside and see if all the, uh, the tubes are in place. See if all the uh, IF transformers are in place. Uh, now's the time to uh, give the set a good look over and see if everything's there. Um, the next thing I do um, is disassemble the whole thing. Take out the number three screws, remove the bottom cover, remove the, uh, the cowl, uh, remove the uh, protection over the, uh, the tuning uh, section, uh, get everything apart, lay it out, and uh, we start the cleaning process. Now, I like to totally give this thing a bath in the sink with uh, some uh, dishwashing uh, detergent. Uh, try to not get any uh, water inside the, uh, the IF cans. I remove them and separately just go over the outside. Uh, once uh, you've given the thing its bath, um, you need to dry it as thoroughly as possible and then bake it. Some people like to bake it in the sun outside. Some people like to put it in the oven. At the lowest temperature the oven will go and uh, give it a good bake out. Make sure all of the water is removed. Um, now that it's clean, you have to start the uh, to, to see if you'd like to polish it up a little bit. I recommend a product called Never Dull. You can get this at any auto accessory store, auto parts store. comes in a little silver can. Uh, you can shine up the, the aluminum pieces quite nicely. If it has a crackle finish, uh, just go over it with Windex and clean it up as best you can. Then after you're done with that process, go through all of the, the contacts on the plug-in IF transformers and the triple uh, front end coils used for the oscillator and the mixer circuit. You can use some deoxid or uh, other type of contact cleaner. Now you replace all of the, uh, the plug-in units. Don't forget to clean the tube sockets and tubes. Start putting the set back together, but we don't completely put it back together. We put it just back together enough that we have full access to everything we need to tune uh, once we're uh, going to bring the, the unit up for the first time. So we're not putting all the covers back on. We certainly are not putting the bottom cover on. We're simply putting it together enough that we can bring the receiver up. The recommended power supply for the set would be uh, to apply the filament voltage. We want to uh, apply the filament voltage for about 15 minutes and you're going to feel and see if all the tubes are warm. You want to make sure you don't have any tubes with open filaments. I've had two of these that had uh, 12 SK7s that were open. Sometimes the 12 a 6 can open as well. Then it's best to have a, uh, a variable DC supply, something you can bring up from 0 to 250 volts DC uh, that's current limited to around 60 milliamps. I used one of my general purpose bench supplies that puts out 350 volts and I put a variac on the front of it and I could vary it from, DC, from 0 to 350 volts while monitoring the current. What I found with this particular receiver was the, there was no smoke, uh, even though the capacitors, of course, are somewhat leaky. I did not have any dead shorts, and the receiver actually came oh, to whatever. life quite What's easily. This, maybe? We had a BC-1T at one of the stations where I was chief engineer, and it was, you know, the same lineup with 833s, but it used a direct coupled uh, driver and I think they had a BC1H and another transmitter same same kind of driver. In the next video we're going to be uh, putting the radio on the bench and we're going to be bringing it up and uh, trying to figure out if uh, the capacitors are in need of re replacement. We're going to look at the uh, 
the set uh, from the standpoint of replacing parts that might have been substituted, uh, returning it back to uh, original condition. We'll talk about uh, uh, typical problems that, that we have with this receiver and uh, getting it back into operating condition. I hope you've enjoyed this first video on the ARC-5 uh, command set receiver. And uh, hopefully you'll look at the second one where we get into uh, troubleshooting on the bench and actually operating the receiver.